So good morning and good afternoon and good evening in some parts of the world. Um, I'm Kathy Onetto and I am a Vice President of Brand Strategy here at Anthem San Francisco and I'm going to be speaking to you today about brand relevance in a changing world. And part of what I'm going to be speaking about today comes from our sightings report that we create that we do on a quarterly basis. And our sightings report focuses on um, looking at trends in the area of marketing, branding, innovation and design, kind of looking all around the globe. So when we talk about brand relevance in a changing world, you know, uh, growth around the world, as I'm sure most of you know, really uh, is elusive sometimes these days, given the changing marketplace, and it's, it's hard won. So what we're seeing is to really maintain relevance with um, your consumer base and to have continue to have a successful business, we're seeing um, brands evolve over time. And what we were seeing in our sightings report was that businesses were evolving in three different ways. And you see on the right hand of the screen uh, some of the different articles that we had written uh, around this topic. And there were really three different ways that we were seeing brands evolve. Um, the first one was around business model reinvention. The second was around extending product offerings into new territories. And the third was around targeting new consumer groups. And today we're going to talk about millennials in particular. So let's start first by talking about business model reinvention. And so why is business model reinvention important? Well, if you uh, listen to innovation gurus or read some of the uh, recent writings on innovation, what you hear is that many people say that business model reinvention is really where you find that transformative, um, large, significant breakthrough uh, breakthrough innovation. It's really around business model reinvention. And what you're seeing up on the screen are some of the examples of uh, that where these companies did not take heed. So you have the likes of Blockbuster and Borders that have filed Chapter 11. You have uh, traditional record stores that essentially have become obsolete. And contrast that to some other examples, such as even, frankly, a Douala juice, which really changed how people think about buying juice from the traditional, say, Tropicana to actually having an orange juice that's like fresh squeezed, or Starbucks changing how all of us drink coffee, frankly. And then think about Amazon changing how we buy books to, of course, Apple with its iPod and iTunes in terms of how we buy music, but even FedEx in terms of how we uh, ship communication around the world to each other. So these are successful examples of uh, business model reinvention. And what we were seeing in our sightings report was we were seeing additional business model reinvention around the idea of evolving the distribution of capital. Two examples of this um, from prior to the time period that we were looking at. It's one is Kiva, which is a nonprofit organization that was focused on microfinance. And what they were doing is using, you know, allowing individuals to invest small amounts of money to have a really big impact around the world. President Obama's campaign took it a step further where they were asking people for small amounts of money, but they were looking for a host of a large group of people to be able to invest um, behind his campaign. And President Obama actually had close to 50% of his campaign dollars come from uh, $200 uh, contributions that were from $200 or less. So what we were seeing in the marketplace was um, examples of this microfunding being applied to different areas, the first being around music, uh, the second being around funding of the arts, and finally, the, the, uh, the final one being around the distribution of capital for college scholarship funds. And really what this is doing is putting the power of capital back into the hands of the people. So the first example is the one around funding the music industry. Not sure how many people are familiar with the company called My Major Company. Very, uh, you know, uh, interesting kind of branding for naming for a company. But they are really a, a traditional record label. And what they allow um, 
individuals like you and I, normal people to do, is actually invest in a new band. Um, and, and then what those bands are able to do is to actually produce um, and distribute their music under the My Major Company label, which is actually um, a little bit unusual for a company such as theirs to be able to have their own label. And what those um, bands are then able to do is to use that capital that people have invested to produce their music, go out on the road, have concerts, things of that nature. And then the revenue from those song sales, the merchandise and those concerts actually go back to not just the band, not just the label, but also the investor. So as an example, an investor in France actually turned $7,000 into a $150,000 return. That's not bad of an ROI. I'm sure all of us would be quite happy to, to get that kind of return. Um, so you know, it's not just good for the band, it's not just good for the investor, but it's also good for the recording and music industry. Actually, as the music industry has gone under change, um, they have not been able to have the funding because of the pressures and the changing business models. They haven't been able to fund as many bands as they used to. So the fact that individuals like you or I can actually invest in these bands such that they have the opportunity to put their music out there is actually good for the music industry and frankly all of us as well to see this new talent. So that's the first example. The second example is funding the arts, is this is, and this is through uh, kickstarter.com, and I'm not sure how many people are familiar with this website, but they've been getting a lot of the press over the last year. And really what this does it is, is it allows creatives and, and art, artists to be able to go to the web and to try to find benefactors to invest in them, to allow them to actually bring their creative ideas to life. And so these creatives um, you know, are able to get people to pledge to their um, artistic endeavor. And it's, they've, what they've been able to do with Kickstarter is they've made it extremely low risk. And so if you have pledged money um, and the creatives aren't able to raise all of the funds, you don't get charged, so you're not out any cash. So most of these projects require a certain level of funding. So if the creatives don't end up getting all the funding that they uh, require, you're not charged. But if they do, then you do, you do get charged and, and you're investing in what they are going to build. And what, what do people get in return? Well, funders receive anything from the actual final product, but sometimes it's actually also just simple, a simple electronic high five. Um, interestingly, what we find with this is that sometimes people are frankly just very um, happy to be a part of something and, are, and actually that intrinsic reward of being able to help somebody bring their vision to life is actually um, reward enough for some of these people. So one example of this is actually um, an iPod Nano watch called the Lunatic, very fun name, um, that actually turns an iPod Nano into a watch. And uh, because this was funded through Kickstarter, and because this individual was able to create this product, um, it's now actually something that is offered um, on the Apple Store. So the final example here is funding for college. And this is a scholar match, which was started by uh, Dave Eggers, uh, who it wrote the book, um, A Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius. Uh, it's a long but great title. And he's actually uh, lives here in San Francisco. And he has had um, a tremendous passion for a, a long time um, in education. And he's actually extremely involved um, within the San Francisco community in education and helping students, um, and in particular around writing, um, given where his talent resides. And one of, the, um, one of the opportunities he saw was he works with all these wonderful students who are having a really hard time finding dollars to help them get to college. And then frankly, what he did and what he was seeing as well was that he was seeing Akiva, he was looking at a Kickstarter, and he was like, huh, maybe there's something that I can do here. So he, him help, so he himself started Scholar Match, um, again, creating a way for people to um, distribute capital in a new way and kind of get behind, get outside of these kind of ambiguous institutions that kind of decide sometimes who gets ca uh, get funding for school versus not or get scholarship funds. So uh, Scholar Match connects these students and helps them make, um, you know, a donor be able to make some contributions to them so they can actually uh, go to college. It's quite, it's quite inspirational and I, if you're interested, I'd suggest going to the website. 
So what does this mean for marketers? You know, it's really about reinventing solving consumer problems. So a few, a few headlines, you know, think revolution, seek inspiration from outside. I think oftentimes people think that creativity and ideas come from divine intervention. It's not necessarily the case. A lot of people are seeking inspiration from outside. So don't be afraid to borrow and build combine ideas um, and build new ways to do uh, the same thing just better. All right, so let's go on to our next topic and this is around extending product offerings uh, into new territories. And we're seeing a number of brands um, that have been doing this more and more. And it could be the case that P&G kind of started this trend as they decided a number of years back to stop creating a bunch of new brands, but to start to really focus on the brands that they had and figuring out how they can make the best um, get the best ROI on that investment. And so you see more and more brands doing a similar thing. So for one of their brands as an example, just look at Crest, which really stopped seeing itself just as a toothpaste product, but rather started looking at um, what they did as serving a broad consumer need of really um, helping people have healthy, beautiful smiles for life. So that's a positive example of uh, how to extend brands. Sometimes you see some brands which extend their products a little too far, so you do need to be careful. This is an example of VW and their Phaeton product, and at least here in the United States, it wasn't quite as successful. Now, mind you, I drive a VW, actually, so it's not that I don't like VWs. I actually like them quite a bit, but this was one example of a brand where they tried to stretch into the luxury car market with an $80,000 car with this equity, and it was a great car. It was well made. It, it met the product requirements, but it didn't just fit the brand, so it ended up not being quite a bit as much of a success uh, here in the United States. So we were seeing a couple of different examples. I'm going to mention four here uh, over the last period of time that we uh, noted in our sightings report that were really uh, seeming to do it right. And they were evolving from their core. And the way that they were evolving, we're going to give an example of evolving from being focused on a target, being focused on a business model, focused on a benefit, and then being focused on a capability. So the first one we'll talk about is focused on Target, and this is Moleskin. And I'm not sure how many people are familiar with Moleskin, but Moleskin creates um, the legendary notebooks is how, how do they speak about it. And they say legendary because uh, they claim that they were used by the likes of Pablo Picasso and Ernest Hemingway um, to kind of capture their drawings and capture their writings and things of that nature. And uh, Moleskin is quite popular um, with a, a particular set and a particular target. And the way that they define who they are marketing to is the modern day nomad. And it's really this urban individual who's on the go, who loves writing, who loves um, the arts, who loves reading, and who loves traveling. And so what Moleskin did is they said, let me really understand what this individual target's needs are, what they would really want, and where they kind of give me permission, frankly, to extend. And so they ended up creating this new complete reading collection that has everything from pens and pencils, carrying cases, reading glasses, and book lights. And I will say, looking at this at first, I mean, I actually do like Moleskin, but on, on first reflection, I was, I was a little dubious. Um, but I have to say, as I've talked with people about this and why it became an example was because the individuals that we know who really love and are passionate about Moleskin were absolutely fine with this type of extension for this brand. They, they were kind of actually quizzical back at me, kind of saying, why do you think this is not a good thing for them to be extending in this way? They actually were quite committed to this brand and interested to start purchasing these new offerings. So the next example is uh, from Tom's, which is a shoe company. And I'm not sure, again, how many people are, know, are aware of Tom's. And this is around business model and mission. Um, Tom's, uh, I, again, here in San Francisco, I feel like Tom's has hit a tipping point. I think one in every five pairs of shoes I walk by every morning happens to be a pair of Tom's. And, uh, you know, what makes this company great, and it, it, they started as one individual kind of type of shoe, but they've started to extend much more traditionally with that same type of shoe um, in different kind of materials and things of that nature. Then they started to um, extend into different forms. But what, what, what Tom's really is about is they are a 
mission-based company. And the individual who started Tom's um, was in Argentina, saw that there were kids in need who didn't have shoes. And so he decided to start a company, a shoe company, where it was anchored on this model of one for one. So if you bought one pair of shoes, anybody who bought a pair of shoes from Tom's, Tom's was going to donate another pair of shoes um, for a child in need. And so they really understood that what we really stand for, where we have credibility, is in this one for one model. And so what they have done is they've extended their brand now into vision care. So now if you buy a pair of glasses from them, they will then in turn actually often vision care in a couple of different ways too. It's not just a pair of glasses, it actually might end up being surgery for an individual who may need that to, to improve their, their vision. So a great example of a brand that's looking at a different way to extend. Uh, another one is around benefits. So Skinny Cow launched in Frozen Novelties uh, in this indulgent kind of good for you space. And they recognize that that's really what they're known for and frankly really loved for. This is a very well-loved brand. And they recognize that they would be able to extend into other indulgent categories. So you're now seeing them extend into guilt-free treats in the candy aisle. So that's a little bit more traditional of a way, but definitely a very powerful way. And then finally, we have capability. This is a little different, but I think everyone knows Amazon is a great example of a brand that has extended. So not only did they take their core capability of being able to sell books online into being able to sell everything from A to Z online, um, but they also took their capability. Frankly, they, they, they are a great example of a brand that um, is looking at reinventing business models. So they didn't let, wait for somebody else to actually figure out how to sell books in a new and different way. They actually actually came out with the Kindle and we're one of the first to really have a well accepted um, you know, e-reader take, take shape in the marketplace and really start to build that market. Um, but the other thing that what Amazon has done is they have a core competence in uh, a couple of technical areas such as um, both uh, their payment processing system as well as frankly managing a server base. So they've actually taken their capability and their core competence and moved from being a B2C uh, supplier of of goods to actually a B2B supplier. So that's been a really interesting and I think a great example of being able to stretch based on capability. So, you know, what is, again, what does this mean from a marketer standpoint? You know, really think about what's your anchor, what are the limits of your brand's relationship with its target consumers, and what will your consumer allow you to do? All right, so our final topic uh, in terms of evolution is targeting new consumer groups. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to speak about millennials. And, you know, we'll start with just why do millennials matter? Um, well, for a few reasons. First off, this is a highly connected group. These individuals have, are, are, have strong networks, have large networks, and frankly, they're more than willing to broadcast and uh, make noise. And not only do they make noise, uh, uh, perhaps on a negative side, but they also actually really do champion brands and, and communicate in positive ways. So you see on the screen a statistic there from Edelman that says at least 80% of millennials have taken action on behalf of a brand they trust, including sharing brand experiences with others, joining online communities, and posting reviews online. So this group really can become brand ambassadors for you and actually champion your brand if you build connection with them. Uh, the other reason you should really care about millennials is because uh, they are quite capable and, uh, you know, when they see a need in the marketplace, either their own or frankly another need, they're going to take advantage and, and go ahead and uh, try to service that need. So the individuals that you're seeing on the screen are actually the founders of Airbnb and I don't know if people are familiar with that company, but essentially they provide inexpensive, convenient, on-demand lodging. So these guys saw, they were actually walking around in downtown downtown San Francisco, people were at a conference, didn't have a hotel, and were searching for a place to stay. And these guys were like, well, hey, I have a room to rent or a room in my you know, apartment. 
come stay here. And they just from that experience and that idea, they founded a company that is growing pretty significantly. And contrast that again, now think about business models earlier, you know, would Marriott or Hilton ever think to do that? Their asset base would keep them from ever thinking that they would want to create a business model outside of their own um, physical hotels. But imagine if they were to actually enter this space, it actually could be quite powerful for those who are trying to rent out their space where, you know, organizing cleaning services, knowing where to get toiletries for people who are going to stay with you. Um, but it's really these millennials who took advantage of the opportunity. You know, so who are they anyway? Well, millennials were born between 1977 and 1994. So in 2011, they uh, are 17 to 34 years in age. Um, shockingly, they make up almost a quarter of the US population. So again, why should you care? Because they're a large group. Um, they are digital natives, as I mentioned earlier, and they're very connected and they're candid and confident. So that's another reason to, to really care about them. But what's interesting about millennials is for them, you know, what's important is really evolving. And so the image on the screen is meant to represent uh, the great American dream of owning a home and two kids and all that good stuff. We couldn't find a picture with a picket fence, but just imagine that in there, right? Uh, that's supposedly what, what all Americans want. Um, and yet for millennials, they grew up in a time, um, and they're frankly coming into the business world or the career, um, the marketplace at a time when the economy isn't so great. You know, you have about 20%, I would say, across the globe, 20% unemployment uh, at, during um, for folks in this age group. And uh, so therefore, um, you know, they're, they're, they're taught, thinking about success differently. Um, they really are thinking about how do I meet my own personal objectives? Uh, they, they are seeking fulfillment. Um, so it's not just the traditional American dream anymore. Uh, they really are focused on building emotional connections. And so when it comes to companies, it's really important to think beyond just the physical goods that you're creating. For them, they really want that emotional element as well. And then take into consideration the fact that boomers are optimistic, they're aspiring, and though they're, they're skeptical. So they're really seeking brands that build relationships with them that are more consistent with how they are even expecting themselves to behave, which is more real, transparent, and genuine. So you need to think about if you're going to connect with millennials, how do I build meaning into my brand? And we're going to show you a couple of quick examples of how people have been doing that to build that intangible connection with, with millennials. The first one is Whole Foods, and, and the way that they've done this is around, frankly, just their product offering, and even beyond that in terms of what they stand for. Um, but you know, we're using one example here, that, but there are many examples um, from Whole Foods uh, where they demonstrate this in kind of their philosophies and how they source products and the products that they offer. In this case, we're showcasing um, what they do around fish, supplying fair trade products, res responsibly farmed seafood, and it really is, it, it builds that trust with millennials because they're doing things the right way. The next one is uh, around business model. Again, Tom's going back to that brand, but this is uh, a great example of a brand that's connecting with millennials. And it's also because millennials are very um, socially aware. They're a, bit, they're a bit more socially aware than other um, generations. And so having a brand that has a social cause, a social movement that they can really get behind, they feel good purchasing these products. They want to put their dollars behind this brand. And then finally, you also have some companies that are frankly just connecting based on culture. And uh, Method and Groupon are a couple of good examples. You know, Method from just frankly trying to acquire talent, which I don't think they have a hard time doing. They have a humanifesto stating that we think perfect is boring and weirdliness is next to godliness. Um, so that, that, that language, that kind of more um, not so perfect approach um, tends to resonate with millennials. And then you have Andrew Mason uh, who founded Groupon who's a millennial himself, who actually said, um, you know, I seek business partners that are genuine and real. He is making business choices based on how other people run their businesses. So again, they're seeking other individuals that are behaving in a way that is consistent with how they want themselves to behave. 
So to connect with millennials, first off, start thinking about them as a target if you're not already. They may not be appropriate for every brand, but certainly consider them given how large of a group they are. You know, think about making products that matter. You know, you can partner with these guys on social causes. You need to do it in a genuine way, but they definitely will participate and I think is a draw to build and create cultural connections with them. And then finally, just build that connection soon because if they have a need and you don't meet it, then they're just going to go meet it on their own given that they are so highly capable. So just to wrap up here, I know I've gone a little bit long, I apologize for that, but in terms of speaking this morning about um, evolving to maintain relevance, again, we talked about business model reinvention, we talked about extending product offerings, and we've talked about new consumer groups. And then what you see up on the screen, if folks haven't seen our sightings uh, report from our last uh, volume too, uh, we have a number of different other topics around marketing, innovation, and design um, listed here up on the screen that one can read about. And there's a link down there at the bottom uh, where you can download the report. And with that, um, I'll leave that up on the screen for just a second if, in case people want to write that down. I want to thank you very much for your time this morning, this afternoon, and this evening. And uh, I will stay on for a little bit longer if people have a couple of questions. All right, so the first question is, um, is there a good approach to follow when thinking about extending your brand? You know, um, the first thing, play, first place I would start is kind of uh, on the two questions that we outlined. First, you know, where does your brand's credibility lie? And then secondly, you know, where do I have permission to extend my brand? Um, you know, here at Anthem, we, we think about this as range architecture. And a couple of other thoughts and, and things that we think about when, when we're doing range architecture is, you know, we really start by thinking about, well, where are those business opportunities? And looking at that, we first start with what's the brand strategy? What are they trying to accomplish? Um, what are, where am I really focusing? What are the core equities of my brand? And then what's the core need that I'm trying to solve for my consumer? What's the space that I'm really operating in? And then once we um, identify a number of opportunities, we go through and we evaluate them based on the size of the opportunity, whether or not we can, you know, we believe the brand can build credibility there and really build a point of difference, whether or not we think the consumer will be able to um, uh, give them, uh, you know, gives credibility for a brand to be in that space. And of course, that's something we can do market research around. Um, and then finally, you also need to think about whether or not you have the resources and internal fortitude, frankly, to move forward with any of these initiatives. Um, we then kind of also think about, well, it's not just where I'm going to play, but it's also when I'm going to play. And what is the appropriate extension to take first with a brand versus second or third? And then finally, you know, we organize that after prioritization and really create that range architecture and create a roadmap for innovation for brands going forward. So hopefully those are a few quick thoughts for, for the individual who, who asked that question. Are there any other questions? So the second question here are, is, um, and our Brand Square folks here have been uh, kind of fielding the question, so millennials are still a fairly young age group. Do you think they'll continue to be such information broadcasters um, and as effective brand ambassadors in the future as they age. Um, well, you know, interestingly, um, you know, the research would say yes. So, um, you know, millennials do really see themselves because of being so familiar with digital technology and because they do see themselves as these broadcasters, um, they actually do see themselves continuing to do this. Um, so Peer Research actually did a study last year around this where millennials were asked this type of question and they said, yeah, in the foreseeable future, we definitely see ourselves continuing to behave in this way. And then when, you know, intuitively, when you think about it um, and look out into to the marketplace, if you take into consideration the fact that some of us older folks uh, and even into boomers and beyond are um, significantly on some of these technologies such as Facebook, one can only imagine that if these folks are at this engaged, that even as millennials change and move into different life stages, that they themselves will continue to behave this way as well. Any final questions? All right, the next question. 
So business model reinvention seems hard, yes. Um, where would you suggest beginning? Um, let me start there first by just referencing even a couple of additional examples. So one, the two that I like to reference, one is um, Intuit, who was founded by Jeff Cook. Jeff Cook um, was uh, formerly from P&G. He then went into consulting. He worked with um, financial and technical companies. And one day he was at home and he was watching his wife try to manage her checkbook. And he was just perplexed by this and saw how cumbersome it was. And he was like, there, there must be a different way. And he combined his knowledge in these other areas, saw that what that need was, and he ended up creating into it. Um, another example is, um, I'm going to get his name wrong, like Omer Pod oh, Podier. I'm going to say it wrong. Obviously, I think I just did. But he's the founder of eBay. So um, first off, what was good for him was that he actually loved the idea of creating new business models. Um, but the second thing was he actually was watching his fiance, who loved Pez dispensers, and he was watching her try to track those down and how difficult it was. And then he also was seeing how traditional classified ads in newspapers and things of that nature were so inefficient in helping her meet that need. Need. So again, he started with, in each of those examples, they started with a really clear defined, what's the problem I'm trying to solve? What's that consumer need? Then they looked holistically at the problem, not with any existing framework. And then they, um, they took other things that they had seen in the marketplace and were starting to say, hey, where can I combine and build to create a new solution? And voila, look at the, the companies that they kind of came up with. So I'm sure it's not quite that easy, but I think there are a few steps um, to get to uh, creating a better way to solve the way that people do certain things in their in their uh, lives. Any final questions? I know we've gone a little bit longer here, but happy to take one final question or we can wrap up. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your time. And I hope that you found this valuable and helpful. Um, hopefully, you will join us for your, our next uh, Brand Square presentation. Have a good rest of your days. Bye-bye.